Hello, my name is Aaron Bustani. Uh, today I have the great pleasure of being joined by the two authors of this fantastic book, The People's Republic of Walmart, Lee Phillips and Mikhail Rozvarsky. Good to have you both on. Great okay. to be here. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions to ask you, but for anybody unacquainted with the book, it is a fantastic book. I think it's one of the most important books on the left this year. I think that's not just because I am prone to hyper hyperbole, but um, I think this is the year we're seeing lots and lots of books on the left addressing really big propositional issues if we want to actually have left governments. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an expression of the fact that the radical left is now engaging with state power and what does 21st century socialism look like? So a very practically oriented discussion ahead of us today. Um, People's Republic of Walmart. For the audience, they'll be thinking, what's Walmart got to do with what a socialist economy might look like or a more socially just economy might look like? Can we start? I'll start with you, Mikhail. Okay. To what extent are modern day free market economies actually free? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, they're free for some, I think, is the is the answer to that. Right. Um, when most of us go into and unfree for a lot of others. I should add, that's the sort of, you know, that's the other side of that. I think when most of us um, go into work, we experience that as a huge realm of unfreedom for the vast majority of us who uh, who do work for a living once we enter, you know, the the shop, the factory, the whatever, the hospital school. Um, it's what the boss says goes. Um, the boss, on the other hand, has a lot of freedom. I mean, the argument we're... Uh, we're making in the book is that um, a lot of the world's biggest, or not not a lot, most of the world's biggest corporations are huge spheres of economic planning. That sort of old bogeyman um, of the right that the right has used as a cudgel um, against the left. You know, this is uh, if you try to consciously control the economy, it'll never work, and we'll probably get into that get into that later. Well, it turns out that once you enter the sort of four walls of the of the firm of the corporation. Um, it's a giant plan, plant system where the managers, and that's what where I think you know that division in freedom exists. That there's uh, a lot of freedom for managers and bosses to set plans within certain limits. Obviously, the market imposes some uh, some limits on that, but there's a lot of sort of rational planning. But for the vast majority of people, for workers, uh, it's a realm of of unfreedom where you know our sort of shared human capacity for decision making um, is completely not even underutilized, but largely unutilized. Um, and I think that's something that we set out to challenge, uh, to challenge in the book. Uh, yeah. Lee, um, so to what extent do we live in a planned economy? To what extent is the idea of the free market just a mystification then, building on that? Well, it, the, um, the economy as a whole is not a planned economy, but uh, within uh, these very, very large um, entities, as, as Mihao was saying, they are entirely planned. This is fascinating for us because uh, the argument that we have from uh, from the right is that the market is always consistently the, the optimum way of allocating uh, goods and services. Uh, I, but internally, uh, as, as Michal said, they're entirely planned. What's fascinating with, with Walmart is that it's the largest corporation in the world. Um, it has the largest number of employees. It, it would be the, it's the third largest enterprise after uh, the People's Liberation Army and uh, the Pentagon. If it were an economy, uh, it would be not in the G20, but on the size of a Sweden or or Switzerland. Wow! Um, it you know it's it's on the on the scale of it, uh, you know slightly smaller, but uh, on the scale of the Soviet Union at the height of its um, you know in the nineteen seventies uh, before sort of you know uh, stagnation sets in. Uh, so that's really interesting because if the you know the, the one of the best arguments that the right ever mounted against the left against socialism was that um, the price signal in the market um, basically captures uh, an infinitude of information uh, within supply chains. Uh, not just that, but also discovers is a mechanism of discovery of information, and that if uh, we want to avoid all of the problems with market exchange in terms of the in growth of inequality, irrational production, and so on and so forth, and replace it with um, with planning, uh, you would have to have this army of bureaucrats that uh, would not be anywhere near as good as capturing all that information. Um, and uh, that would lead to a mismatch between supply and demand, 
a, uh, on, a, on a gross scale that would produce uh, significant shortages, in turn chaos. The only way that you could sort of uh, grapple with that chaos would be some sort of authoritarianism. And then, bada bing, bada boom, you have the Soviet Union. That was sort of the historical argument. Um, it, it's, it's a really bloody good argument. The trick is that if that were true, then Walmart shouldn't work. Walmart shouldn't exist. Because it, if it is a, an, uh, an internally, an entirely planned economy, uh, yes, it exists within a sea of prices, but internally it's entirely planned. Um, what makes it work um, uh, compared to the Soviet Union? Um, so yeah, it's, um, but we, we should take some lessons from this in that uh, basically it shows that planning works. However, it's authoritarian planning rather than democratic planning. Maybe we can get into that in a little bit. Yeah, so we, we're obviously talking about the firm to an extent. We're talking yeah. about Co Coase, is it Coase's Ro theorem? Yeah, yeah. Ro Ronald Coase. Ronald yeah. Coase. Um, he sort of stumbles upon this really in the 20s, the 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking about this a few weeks ago to a gentleman who writes The Economist. He came on. Right. Um, and he was talking about, you know, just intervention in free markets. And obviously it's the paradigmatic example. And it, it's really striking how few people actually on the left engage with this issue where, you know, yeah. We have this mystification that any intervention in free markets will create a mismatch of resources, create disequilibriums, etc. And like you say, the absolute heartbeat of modern economies are firms which don't operate like that. Now, is there any is there any countervailing account that could come from somebody who's defending the status quo who might say, well, so what? That's irrelevant. We already know about coasts, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the traditional argument has always been but ultimately, they still rely on prices. Right. Right. So it doesn't matter how big they get, they're still existing, like Lee said, in this sort of sea of prices. And that's and that's the bit that delivers sort of useful information or crucial, crucially useful information right. um, to them. Uh, and I think the counter argument there is that we see increasingly, and this is where sort of I think today differs from the 1930s when which was the last time when the left and the right were sort of hashing hashing this out is that we do have um, an increase in information technology that basically you know produces this total surfeit of information of various kinds of useful information and it's I, I just think it's you know it's a sort of poverty of imagination to think that um, this is the one method of finding a way to basically align, you know, sort of social goals with individual or lower level goals. That's ultimately the rights argument that you need some sort of mechanism that will align, you know, what do we want to do as a society with what do individuals or individuals sort of units like firms do. Uh, and so, I think throughout history, you've seen that there's different ways of doing that. And especially now when we have information, you know, again, Hayek, uh, one very small thing, Hayek um, had this sort of semi uh, mystical quote where at one point he calls uh, prices action at a distance and I I'll kind of find it funny reading that today you know in 2019 when each of us has a or most of us have a smartphone in our pockets and you know this idea that this like gee whiz action at a distance um, happens through the price system it just seems kind of quaint. I mean is it fair to say actually that the idea of markets functioning through prices like that is in itself a form of machine control? Because you've got Paul Mason recently in his book, you know, Clear Bright Future, and he says we have all these existential quandaries about, oh, would we ever allow an AI to run society? Right. Well, we already delegate a vast yeah. amount of sort of ethical decision making to, well, actually, this computer C says computer. no, except it's not the computer, it's the market. Uh, so yeah. is, that, is, that a is that a fair sort of assessment? And then I, I want to ask you about the socialist calculation debate. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be quick. I think that's overall generally fair i mean i think there's i think there's maybe a bit more to it but generally yes this is something this is a mechanism a, and a lot of the a lot of the austrians did in a way refer to it as a computer but one that's able to deal sort of with indeterminacy so that's the one thing that i would add that the the right really sees this as a specific kind of computer that doesn't take you know like a set program mm -hmm. but is one that's able to uh, deal very well in a dynamic environment, but overall, I think I think that's a very good way of looking at it, um, and of again demystifying some of that, some of this you know ideo ideology around the around the free market and around sort of freedom. So the socialist calculation debate, which you explicitly talk about in the book, 
we've already sort of really touched yeah. upon it is this idea that it's only really through the price mechanism that you can have this optimal allocation of resources and it, it feeds into a sort of everyday off the shelf ideology for just capitalist realism right you don't even yes, you don't even need to think that you're defending yeah. capitalism it's just that's how prices work that's how they've always worked mm -hmm. and what hayek and friedman and people like this say is that this will always be superior to centrally command economies but centrally commanded economies because they are acting with limited information now we we can debate whether that was ever true or not let's say it was true let's say it's historically contingent it was limited to a certain period of time what you guys are saying is that technology now makes that general debate quite moot and furthermore if anything big data gives us far greater information than prices do yes is that correct right. yeah absolutely but we, i mean you could also say that um if if that were the case if uh what you you know you require some sort of um uh, external prices uh, for that, then you, you could say the same thing about the Soviet Union. Soviet Union traded with the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, so that doesn't really work. So you have to have some other explanation as to why um, uh, the Soviet Union um, did not work rather than simply planning. Because if, if planning is, if, 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 if a command economy is the reason that the Soviet Union didn't work, then neither should uh, Walmart, neither should Amazon, neither should, uh, should any of these. And just sort of um, saying, oh, well, we know about coast. I mean, that's sort of, that's, that's their sort of, um, uh, get out of jail free card and they basically what we're doing this is we're looking at it a little bit more seriously uh, investigating that um, and really thinking about it more deep and the reason that this is this is absolutely necessary for us as socialists why we need to take uh, we need to return to the the socialist calculation debate um, is because it is hard um, to if we are going to replace uh, the market and all of the inequalities that, that accompany the irrationalities that accompany that uh, it is not just enough for us through the force of will and our optimism and um, and, and and sense of injustice to to right the, the the wrongs. We actually do have to think very seriously about uh, 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 about the challenges of calculation. And what's fascinating about the the uh, the, the, the socialist calculation debate from the 30s through the through the 50s was and why the Hayek and so on and so forth made such really good arguments was because they in some respects were on the back foot um with uh the existence of of of, of socialism social democracy um uh, militant trade unions um they were responding to uh, an ascendant um sort of intellectually confident left mm. and they had to be as good and now what we see and it's really we were talking about this just before we we started here the the rights response to our book already and i think uh to yours uh, as well is that it's sort of off the shelf arguments they're yeah. not really responding mm -hmm. uh, to this um and I, th I find it it's it's very interesting and exciting to be in a moment of uh where the left once again is beginning to be intellectually confident um and um uh yeah that they're having to respond to us once again which is nice yeah i mean sorry i, just, I went off in a bit of a, no it's good i mean no, I was just because obviously my book was launched yesterday Tuesday. Congratulations. Congratulations, yeah. Congratulations to you. Happy to be joining this oeuvre of, you know, uh, quite inflammatory opinion on the left <laughs> that the right feel they have to respond to. Um, and yeah, the, the responses were, or even the responses in the reviews prior to the publication, Danny Finkelstein in the Times. Right. And it's just churlish, undergrad, Facebook post level oh, really? yeah, yeah. prose. And it's like, okay, climate change, demographic ageing, um, automation, the collapse of the neoliberal model since 2007-8. Whatever your politics, we can all agree that this is a thing. And they're not even talking about that. They're not talking about, for instance, this book as an intervention to those debates. Yeah. They're just saying, do you apologise for 1917? <laughs> <laughs> you know, will any sort of effort to make society better result in, you know, the Russian Civil War Mark II or, yeah. you know, uh, the Ukraine famines and yeah, so on? Yeah. And like it's a, it's an off-the-shelf debate. Is there, are there any smarter people on the right? There must be people. For instance, my book got positive reviews. I know you have as well in, in certain publications. One might not expect the Financial Times, for instance. Yeah. Are there not people in those circles who look at this and go, "There's something really here that's quite interesting." Have you have you encountered any reviews like that? The anarcho-capitalists were, yeah. were actually quite yeah, I was gonna interesting. Say, of, all, of all people, the the anarcho-capitalists who are willing to take it. Um, so, you know, a fringe, but again, you know, someone like Hayek was a fringe figure uh, in his time. But there are there's definitely people on the right who are 
were willing to take it seriously. There's the Reinventing Capitalism book, uh, yeah, Schoenberger, yeah. this, uh, I think he was like a Victor Meyer con yeah. consultant management, sort of, you know, management consultant who's written kind of the definitive kind of pop book on big data and now has a second one about how big data is going. You know, he's basically making some of our arguments in, in a, the usual type of thing of kind of, you know, saving capitalism from the from the right. But he's even willing to say that this, you know, maybe this new system enabled by information technology will not really be capitalism, but something else. But we'll still have the higher, you know, hierarchies and all and mm -hmm. all of that. But yeah, so there's definitely people on the right thinking through this stuff. Um, and That's... I think there's a big contrast between them. Yeah. And the people who are just, you know, like making these off the off the shelf, uh, off the shelf arguments and, you know, laugher curve you know, writing on a napkin <laughs> level of, of intellectual curiosity, yeah. right? Meyer Schoenberger, I think, is very, very interesting. And because, it, 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 as you say, he's in many respects making some of the similar arguments we yeah. make, but from the opposite point of view, yeah. um, he's a nakedly, you know, pro-capitalist, and he's just finding fascinating that, that more and more um, uh, transactions uh, already um, uh, are taking place where the price signal is playing a smaller and smaller role yeah. now that we have um, sort of machine learning, uh, big data allowing for multi-dimensional comparison of different different factors. He uses the example sometimes of um, um, uh, airline uh, ticket uh, recommendation engines where you as a human might find it actually quite difficult to like, okay, so I want to fly in this state or possibly these other dates and I don't want to fly out of this uh, uh, this uh, this airport, but I could if it were cheap. And but I want an aisle seat, and my wife wants a uh, a window, and uh, but I don't I don't want any uh, stop. All those different things, mm. and we actually find it very difficult as humans to to have that multi dimensional comparison. But the recommendation engines knows, having seen how you've purchased things in in the past, begins to actually uh, know you better than you know yourself. Mm is able to make these recommendations. The price is just one smaller aspect of this. Yeah. Um, what's fascinating, I think, there with him is that you can sort of see um, uh, an, an, uh, as sort of, there's, you know, there's a challenge to neoliberalism since 2008. Uh, they, are, they haven't really grappled with the, they haven't fully resolved the, the crisis. Yeah. And there are interesting figures on, horrifying figures on the right that are like people like Marco Rubio, who are making arguments that there needs to be more state planning, more intervention, more industrial policy um, uh, for the United States to be able to compete against the uh, against China. Mm. Right. And you could imagine um, a world where sort of after neoliberalism, where uh, the right fully recognizes once again the necessity of planning, but uh, hierarchical. Uh, authoritarian planning and return to that and never being any sort of like final reckoning between the classes mm. and so our argument is 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 it is the sort of the, the flip side of that which is planning is is possible it's everywhere already uh it's hierarchical and what we need to be doing is making it work for us we need to make sure that it's democratic yeah yeah i mean in a way we're you know it's the reverse of kind of a, of what you said where every the sort of stock response to the right is to tar everyone with that brush of 1917. In a way, our book is sort of, you know, tarring Walmart with the same brush as the Soviet Union. Here's a, here's another case of authoritarian planning. Um, and it also, you know, it also works for, for now, but it's also deeply authoritarian. I mean, I think, and I think the right's responses are largely to see this as a sort of technocratic problem um, and how to deal with, you know, the sort of rise of information technology in a technocratic way, whereas we're trying to come at it from the you know typical perspective of of the left of socialists, which is what does this mean for human freedom, for human liberation, for all that? Where's the human you know where's the human being? Where's where's the worker in this? And and what does that mean for um, for for us as people who who might be able to decide over our own destiny? Right? Yeah, because I, I look at big data and I look at all the tendencies you're talking about in the book, and I basically see two potential futures. So one is data-driven public services, universal basic services, which are freely available to all on the back of declining cost of information, energy, labor, etc. I think that's one highly plausible future. Of, uh, so permanently cheaper, the question is how cheap, right? Uh, and then a big variable in all of that will be big data. So if you've got universal basic service of uh, public buses, free public buses for everybody everywhere, obviously, predictive modeling about who's going to go where, for how long, etc. cetera, be very good in allocating resources for a public transport network. So that's one future. Another is China. Yeah. 
where you have WeChat, which is not just a social network, but also right. a payment system. You have smart cities, which have facial recognition around them, and people will be fined for jaywalking or so on, something like that, a minor in, infraction, yeah. and they'll be immediately fined, it'll be through their mobile phone. Yeah. Is that is that a fair is that a fair conclusion to say that planning of a considerably increased kind is kind of inevitable? The question is, in whose interests? Is that you hit the nail on the head? Absolutely. Yeah, the so. um, this Marco Rubio report that came out a, a couple of months ago, um, made in China twenty twenty five, where he makes this call for you know more uh, planning to be uh, so, so that the United States can stay ahead in robotics, AI, biotech, a number of other uh, key areas. Then Intel came out with a similar white paper making an argument for um, uh, and, and uh, more interventionist industrial policy, and one can absolutely imagine. A, a sort of convergence of these the, the these ideas and the 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 the, the dystopia is gen, is generally that um, inability to I think to say make a distinction between the sort of surveillance capitalism of Amazon and Facebooks of the world and the uh, surveillance communism of the the People's Republic of, of China and mm. and yeah social credit and mm. all these these mm. uh, a convergence of those ideas. I'm not predi- uh, predicting that that's going to happen. Mm. But I do think that the, the key at the moment for the left is um, in, f- in the in face of both of these sort of tendencies is to remain as the guardians of freedom, that we whatever path that they go down uh, along this more sort of um, uh, definitely surveillance sort of um, a planned market economy, mm. that our responsibility is to be the, you know, the champions of freedom and democracy in that in, in those situations. And we already see how much Silicon Valley cooperates with you know, with the U.S. government, with the surveillance state, with uh, the national security state, all that. We also see, I mean, the uh, the upside is we also see tech workers starting to rebel against that um, and some, you know, very nascent forms of, of organizing there. They're partly driven by working conditions, but partly driven by these sort of, you know, deeply political pressures where people see what, uh, see these possible futures. And again, not, you know, not making really super dystopian predictions, but even today there's enough there that, you know, people don't want to be involved in, um, in whatever projects, whether at home or uh, or abroad, we saw that with with Microsoft and some of the facial recognition stuff and, and other things. Um, and yeah, and in terms of the in terms of uh, the sort of smart city thing, we're already seeing that there's Sidewalk Labs, which is run by Google, setting up shop in actually Toronto, Canada, um, and trying to create these sort of model, the first sort of model neighborhood uh, that would take this sort of capital capitalist road of big data and planning, marrying urban planning with economic planning, with with a host of other things um, and enabling the kinds of, you know, the kinds of fairly, again, authoritarian technocratic solutions um, that uh, that we're deeply critical of here. I mean, it's one of the things I really agree with in the kind of account of Marx's Grinris by Antonio Negri. And there's lots of things to disagree with Antonio Negri, <laughs> but the idea of the real <laughs> subsumption of society the gradual expansion of yeah. the surveillance of the factory superimposed onto society at large. And I think that's a that's a that's quite a clear and prescient account of what Google wants to do, for instance, with smart cities. It seems to me they want to gather and collect as much data as possible about every iterative act, every movement, uh, and somehow subordinate it to a, a you know a profit motive. Yeah, yeah, and I think that I think the challenge for the left is to come up with. Uh, and I don't think we even pretend to do that here, but to start to come up with ideas for these kinds of coordinated, coordinating functions to be done democratically, to mm. be done in a way that, you know, somehow walks that tightrope between centralization and decentralization, between decision making uh, at the individual level and, and freedom and control, um, as well as sort of those big, broad social goals that we'd want to achieve together. Uh, in a way that exact, you know, that avoids exactly this kind of this kind of subsumption. Um, and I mean, I think, yeah, I think that that observation is happening. The the one we uh, we quote in the book is that also famous uh, quote from Marx, where I I won't get it right, but it's something about you know how we learn um, about society at the factory. Like you know, the factory in his time teaches us just how uh, reliant we are on other people, just how social beings we yeah. are. Where you know, production under feudalism or under other social systems would not have taught that. Um, and I think this is, you know, sort of like the next logical step. If that's already implicit in capitalism is this sort of reliance on others and this common building of a world. 
why don't we actually, you know, actualize that which is sort of trying to trying to show us where we actually socially decide on what we want to be doing. Well, a question on central banks. All right. So you, you both say quite provocatively that the Federal Reserve is effectively a form of central planning right. or the Bank of England is a form of central planning. And it strikes me, especially in a world of 10, 10 years, almost 0% interest rates, mm -hmm. that clearly there's a measure of planning going on yeah. with credit allocation in our yeah. societies, but ideology veils that as planning and this is still the free market. Can you go into how central banks specifically or more so in the last 10 years are expressions of central planning? Yeah, and that's an argument we actually, I'll make a plug for J.W. Mason, uh, an economist at the U.S. who had, in the U.S. Um, works for uh, John Jay College and, um, and the Result Institute has been helpful in making this argument for, for quite some time um, in, a, in a provocative way. And I think he's one of the people who, uh, again, who we looked in, who's really sort of left ecosystem of people taking these issues seriously. Um, I mean, I think it's it hasn't been even since just since the financial crisis. We have a, a sort of quote here from n notes from the Federal Reserve from their uh, rate setting meetings, uh, even dating back to the 50s, where they're going into great detail about the state of like contract negotiations between uh, the auto unions and the auto companies um, and taking all this input from uh, from the economy and using, you know, and, and thinking about some really big social goals, like we don't want, you know, wages to rise too fast. Or we don't want work, you know, we want to clamp down expectations or things like that, where they're, they are, as you say, you know, it's not explicit planning. It's not like you will do that, but it's setting the bounds yep. within which economic subjects, and especially now, right, with where we have, we've had various kinds of um, of policy for guidance, uh, you know, QE, all of that, which create create these quite tight bounds within yeah. which economic actors um, actors will act. So you know, like even if you don't care about the central bank, right? If you're if you think you're an auto worker or something like that, the central bank really cares about you. Um, and it's yeah, and it's basic, you know, and that filters down then to uh, to the commercial banks, investment banks, and it's the very basic things about life. Like, will I have a place? to live? Will I get a mortgage? Will I, will I be able to get an education? Will I get a student loan? Right? All of these, the rationing of credit is basically the rationing of sort of like life opportunities to, to a large degree, especially for the people who don't have capital already. Right? So I think, I mean, it has a deep impact, um, even by, by so, setting these bounds. So it was always the case, let's say it was always the case that central banks were effectively operating as some kind of central planning. Yeah. Was that elevated, however, with the move to debt fueled growth, the rise of personal credit, etc. Because obviously, personal consumption became the backbone of the economy, often leveraged off inflated assets like home ownership, often leveraged mm -hmm. off debt, you have securitized student debt, securitized debts of all kind. I mean, so is there, do you think a substantially changed role for central banks as planners in the last 30, 40 years? Or is it just all the way back to the early 20th century with the Federal Reserve. So if you look at like inflation busting, for instance, I mean, that's yeah. quite a new agenda that Fed, the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England and central banks generally have had. And and for me, that's a paradigmatic example of yeah. central planning. Mm -hmm. We do not want people, the wealthy people's assets um, to, you know, really move about. We certainly yeah. don't want the debt of poor people to suddenly be lost yeah. to inflation. So it does seem to me quite a, a, a structural role that has to play in neoliberalism more generally. Yeah, but I think I think that's the I think that's the key there. I think it's a shift in objectives rather than a shift in the degree of planning. I mean, right. there's a really fascinating book that I there's too many things to read. There's a great book by a French scholar, Eric Monet, an economist um, that goes into the role of actually the French central bank in the 1950s and 60s in really driving. Um, industrial policy through credit allocation and what's the making, name of the book? I need to read that. We need I, to. Yeah, I need to. F I controlling credit. Controlling credit. Who's controlling? The Eric Monet. M O N N E T. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, and it's it's an academic study, but it's it's fascinating. I've just read the introduction, so there's not you know there's not not much there, but it but it's a case study again, like going back again to that same time that I was talking about with the Federal Reserve in the fifties where the objectives were different and some of the tools were different, where there was like much more sort of direct allocation of credit and different kinds and different kinds of tools. I mean, remember we had like wage and price controls even in uh, in the US and lots of other countries in the in the 70s as some, one of the first initial responses to, um, we certainly had them in Canada in the 70s, um, to 
uh, to the initial sort of stagflation crisis. So I think banks, central banks have always had this role. It just will be different tools uh, and different uh, and different objectives. Uh, but I think they've had a really, a really central role sort of at the heart of the economy. So, OK, so I've got I'll come back. I'll come to, I'll come back to the central bank stuff in a second, I guess. I mean, it's an, inter it's an interesting um, uh, empirical question as to whether there has been any sort of uh, uh, increase in inter interventionism. But I, I yeah, I would definitely agree that it's um, uh, it, it's just a tr change in um, in the objectives rather than the in kind. But we, that's interesting for us because then we can then set the uh, a different set of objectives. Yeah. So I wonder if what's happened with central banking, like so much of neoliberalism is Basically, the objectives change, but it's masked as retrenchment. And it's not really retrenchment. It's just you're doing something you weren't previously doing. And, you know, we can talk about a lot of things where that's relevant. I mean, what John McDonnell and Labour are saying in this country in regards to the central bank having some oversight and keeping house prices down, yeah, and improving yeah, yeah. productivity, improving wages. Yeah. And you're getting lots of kickback from the financial establishment. And you're thinking, don't you want higher productivity? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but is that to what extent is that quick answer? Because I want to move on to the Soviet yes. Union. But to what extent is that just an outgrowth of ideology or or, 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 or surely it's it favors yeah. them to have higher rates of productivity i don't get it yeah no i don't no i, I think i don't get it. I, I mean yeah they're too they're too comfortable and there's too much sort of you know there's they it's it's in a way it's too good that the redistribution of sort of has sort of swamped right the like the massive redistribution is to a certain degree swamp this need for higher productivity uh because they're able to uh to get larger parts of the surplus or larger parts of, right. sort of social gains but I think that's a good, I mean, I think that's a good question. And even the U.S. Federal Reserve to this day has a dual mandate of fighting inflation and um, and aiming at full employment. It's just, again, it's ideology and it's and it's uh, and it's, uh, you know, priority setting and it's a flexible approach to policy by those who are actually setting it to where you can see that, again, those sort of rational and very human directed sort of kernels. OK, question for you. Why did the Soviet Union fail? We've got to turn the the argument on its head. The uh, within the socialist calculation debate, the uh, as I sort of discussed before, which is now uh, as we were saying, the sort of off the shelf argument uh, from the right since um, uh, you know 1991, which is well, any attempt to to plan an economy, uh, you will inevitably have the shortages um, uh, that will result in chaos. Resolve the chaos with uh, with authoritarianism. That argument actually gets it backwards. Um, if you if you read the history, the sort of economic history of the the Soviet Union, what you find is that planning um, comes in fits and starts. Um, it's many years in before uh, planning really takes off. Um, the the state begins to take over large sections of the economy, not because they had this sort of uh, plan to well, okay, if we're going to replace the market with uh, something else. Mm. Um, we will have to take over the the sectors. It was more that so, you know. It, huge swathes of the economy during the civil war were just collapsing mm. and so the state was just sort of moving in and um, um uh, trying to, to resolve those uh those bottlenecks and, and so on and so forth um with the the auth it's the authoritarianism that undermines the uh, the quality the of quality of the information in the in the in the planning rather than planning leading to a deterioration of informa uh, information leading to the authoritarianism if you with the the, the Stalin counter revolution by you know the late 19, 1920s, um, you if, in that in those situations you had uh, if if you're in a on the shop floor and you are in charge of um, you, know, you know counting how many widgets uh, that have been uh, produced and you haven't met your target you'll lie about that because you are scared of uh, being sent to the gulag or be, even being shot or um, so there's a that leads to a deterioration of information in the system. Mm. Or alternately, you will say, um, uh, you'll under uh, report what you're capable of doing and then showing, oh, fantastically, magically, we, we beat our, our target. Um, I still don't have to go off to the gulag or, or be shot. It's the authoritarianism that undermines the planning. Now, what's, what's fascinating about this with, I've used the word fascinating too many times now, what's very, very interesting with respect to the authoritarianism within the Walmarts of the world is that those are authoritarian too, but they're not authoritarian the same uh, the same sort of pain of death level. Mm. Uh, you'll, you know, you don't meet your target, you might be demoted or you might be fired, which is not great, but it's it's certainly not being shot. 
Um, and so there's uh, there's a there's there's less of a deterioration of information in the system there. But what's what's tantalizing about that is that um, if the degree uh, if there's a uh, if there's a correlation between the scale of authoritarianism and the in, uh, the inferiority of the the information in, in in the system, then therefore the lower the level of authoritarianism, the greater the, the fidelity of the information in the system is to should be to reality. Mm. So I guess to sum up, for me, the book's kind of composed of three parts. The first is how imminent within contemporary capitalism we see forms of planning which could be the basis for yeah. a new socialist society. We engage with these sort of century-long debates really about the role of planning and the role of prices in allocating resources. And then the final bit is a review of the legacy of the USSR, but also looking at some understudied individuals who engage with these problems but because of political repression and so on like Kantorovich and so on yeah. they weren't given the role they mother otherwise might have had and it's quite interesting that it's clear you know i don't think you explicitly say it you, you touch on it though about there's clear parallels in the 1930s between a move to state planning in the us the rise of gdp yeah. with kuznets and so on and more or less the soviets are doing quite similar stuff and there's a problem that's waiting to be solved about how do you measure national output how do you measure the economy and it's sort of multi multifarious ways and what's interesting for me is they say the capitalist realists will say oh well, the economy is kind of too complex to grasp etc etc but then like reading the football scores at the end of every week you go to the back of the economy right. gdp quarterly growth and so if, if that's such an easily understandable non-mystified metric why, why should the rest of the economy not be like that i guess finally regarding states and markets what can socialists do in the here and now what sort of yeah. what sort of demands can be made uh, if you're a Bernie supporter or AOC follower on Twitter or a Labour Party member here in the UK or anywhere else in the world and you're a socialist and you engage in electoral democratic politics or even non-electoral democratic politics, what what can you learn from this book and then say to people that hold public office, we should be doing this? I think a lot of the things that, at least when I think of, for example, Bernie in the US, a lot of things that they're doing are already on the lines of this. For example, I think the Medicare for all demand in the US as sort of in a way absurd, it seems, say, from Canada the, or the UK, where we've had socialized health care um, for, for 50 years, uh, even though it's not perfect, even though it's not democratic, even though it is sort of, you know, this kind of paternalistic nationalization at times, at least it is sort of a decommodified, democratically in some way decided over sector. Uh, I think that demand um, is is a really good one. And then for example, in the UK and other countries, I think looking at big sectors of the economy that could be decommodified, um, where there are already existing movements to, to start to do this. Um, pharmacare is another one, and looking at actually the production of, of pharmaceuticals, which uh, we don't have time to go into, but there's huge, huge you know problems with, with markets um, allocating resources for, for what gets produced, especially in terms of antibiotic resistance, all this kind of yeah. stuff. Um, Childcare, transit, you mentioned already. Um, so I think on that sort of very, very high level social scale, like here's a sector of the economy that we could um, run democratically in in the sort of very abstract um, overarching way. Um, but I think at the same time, and I hope that comes through in the book, um, looking at, you know, that sort of low level of democracy, how can we democratize workplaces? And I think that's where UK labor um, is doing uh, a really good job under Corbyn at looking at, at both of those, right? What are alternative models of, of ownership for particular enterprises, particular projects, and ones that give people more of a say, um, more of a capacity to participate in that planning at the sort of shop, you know, factory, whatever, uh, whatever level. And hope, you know, and then you kind of you have those synth those pinchers that uh, that are moving in, in, in both directions from the bottom up and from the um, and from the top down. And I mean, and we talked about central banks a lot. I think doing that job of demystifying these big institutions, repoliticizing them, and cutting against that really strong uh, neoliberal argument that I think is falling apart slowly, that these are just like outside the realm of politics, that this is just like pure dry economics kind of working itself out. Mm. Um, I think being being really brave and forward about saying no we can have different social goals you know right at the heart of monetary policy or at the heart of these like large um institutions that already have a coordinating function but ha that have been effectively depoliticized so i think there's a whole host 
in short, there's a whole host of things because I think we, as we try to show, the planning is really everywhere in our economy. It's just making it explicit and making it participatory, making us actually be the agents of it rather than small groups of people. The two examples I would give uh, concretely yeah. would be one, yes, I do really want to uh, underscore the, the scale of the threat that we face from uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, it was fascinating a few weeks ago to see the UK's uh, antimicrobial resistance czar um, uh, moot, uh, sorry, d discuss the idea of uh, potentially nationalizing uh, big pharma in order to resolve uh, this problem. Um, uh, you, you, viewers might not be aware, but um, you know, basically 30, uh, 35 years ago, the late major pharmaceutical companies got out of the business of doing any sort of research and development or even commercialization of uh, new classes of antibiotic. Research continues to happen, but at, uh, 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 public universities or government labs, which do not have the money to to, to engage in clinical trials. Um, and uh, so at, fast, this the, the UK uh, antimicrobial resistance are happens to be a former um, uh, executive with Goldman Sachs. I mean, I, it, um, and his, his argument is that they need, might need to be nationalized uh, because the um, uh, antibiotics are simply uh, insufficiently profitable. If you, um, uh, you know, take a, a course of antibiotics for five, six uh, weeks, at the end of that, you want the infection gone. You don't, you're not going to be taking a drug every day for the rest of your life as you would with some sort of chronic disease which is where the real money is um and that the scale of the threat there is uh is sort of undermining modern medicine it is probably um even more uh, of an existential threat to the, our modern way of life um throwing back to victorian sort of um uh, types of medicine uh, most of modern medicine depends upon a background of antimicrobial protection. Mm. Um, even uh, diagnostics uh, sometimes uh, uh, do that. So it really is uh, very existentially threatening. Um, and that would be, a, I would add that as a sort of number one. In fact, I, I kind of wish that there was as much of a, a left movement around antimicrobial resistance as there is around climate change. It is, it, and it's, it's happening much faster. With uh, the Green Deal, I'm very excited about that framing because for and, and, um, it is about planning now. It's talking about infrastructure, um, state-led development, um, um, uh, full employment. Uh, it's uh, and it leaps over the the two sort of main frames framings of the of the climate threat that we've had so far, which are both forms of capitalist realism. One is sort of like uh, uh, market mechanisms of carbon taxation or cap and trade. Uh, or um, uh, feed-in tariffs, um, which end up, you know, neg more negatively impacting uh, working uh, working people. On the other side, there's a sort of like personal, individual. Uh, what you know, what can I do? Can I, you know, travel? You know, fly less or whatever. And again, it's this sort of individualized, mm. uh, capitalist, realist uh, conception of 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 responsibility for this. Uh, the Green New Deal framing for the very first time. Um, locates the real source of the problem of, um, of of market failure of who is responsible not as individuals but a system the market system some of the particular demands within it I would like to see a little bit more robust I think some uh, that so I have some minor criticisms there I'd like to see more engagement with trade unions from the get-go where um, Green New Deal activists have from the start worked with uh, trade unions they've had much more success mm. than the ones where uh, those areas where sort of activists or environmentalists have come up with their series of demands and never spoke mm. to trade unions and and now there's some you know there's a number of trade unions who've actually been uh, protesting uh, the green new deal in california and elsewhere in the united states some some even some quite radical unions like the the, uh, the uh, elect electrical workers so uh, there needs to be a sort of finessing of that but overall the framing is absolutely an example of, of what we're talking about in terms of planning as a solution to climate change and raft of other um, uh, environmental issues rather than degrowth or individual consumption or uh, market mechanisms, cap and trade or whatever. It's interesting you mentioned the, um, uh, the pharmaceutical stuff because in my book, I talk about a great disorder and all these crises. I don't talk about that one, but most people aren't aware of this. In 1900, yeah. the global causes, like leading cause of death globally, pneumonia, infectious influenza. Disease. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It was all infections. Yeah. And we just take it for granted yeah. that increasingly causes of death will be dementia, cancer, yeah. stroke, age related conditions. But the oh, it's one of the greatest uh, humanitarian developments. 
uh, it's it, it is such a precious thing. It, it, you know, a price above rubies, um, um, antibiotics, and and they weren't patented. No. Fleming didn't patent yeah, 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 penicillin, yeah, yeah. which is interesting. Oh, it is, yeah. yeah, absolutely. There's all sorts of lovely Comrade little Fleming. <laughs> all sorts of lovely um, uh, stories of decommod of sort of socialist ethoses of, of socialist values within the history of, of modern medicine. Um, and, you know, revival of that is is absolutely necessary. Sorry, they needed, yeah. On that note, thank you, gentlemen. The book is available in all good bookshops and some bad ones as well. Um, very much worth reading. How much is it? Uh, priceless. Uh, priceless. priceless. <laughs> um, you know the Canadian we dollars. I think it's about yeah. 10 or 11 quid in the UK. 10 quid, I think, in 9. the UK. 9.99. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, don't, we don't like to talk about the price of our book, you know. Well, this is the thing. We go, oh, how can it be a communist book because it's not free? It's a book. It's not a mode of production. They're two different <laughs> things. Um, if only it was that easy. Thank you very much again. It's available on the Verso website and bookstores. Don't get it from Amazon, but do give them a review on Amazon. Give them a good one. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Thanks so much, Aaron.